Goddess Kring Radio. Shannon Kring. Goddess Kring. Shannon Kring. Goddess Kring. Hey, this is Shannon Kringen, Goddess Kring. This is podcast radio broadcast number 11 of Goddess Kring, Shannon Kringen, that's me. It is December 29th, 2016. I'm excited that 2017 is almost here. I am going to be dancing and romancing on New Year's Eve. My boyfriend is in a rock and roll cover band and I'm going to be doing that on New Year's Eve and bringing in the new year. I will say that I recently had a scare with my cat. I wanted to talk about nutrition and medical professionals. It seems to me that um, I know a lot about nutrition and I see a naturopathic doctor from time to time. And I'm somebody who doesn't just do whatever a doctor tells me, whether it's a, an animal veterinary person or a human physical doctor. I have a tendency because of my educational background and being raised by parents who taught me to question everything. I have a tendency to listen to what a doctor says and also especially what a naturopathic type doctor would say because naturopaths are taught more about nutrition and how nutrition and what you eat, whether you're a a cat, a dog, or a human, or any kind of animal really, affects your health and your immune system is key to your health. So whatever health issue you have, if you eat in a way and you exercise and get enough sleep and drink a lot of water in a way that helps your immune system as much as possible, and then in addition to that, with proper nutrition and exercise, in addition to that, if you need like, you know, medication or antibiotics or surgery or physical uh, therapy in some way to help your body heal from an injury, then you do that. But if you don't also practice proper nutrition to get your biochemistry as healthy as possible, then how can you really expect to heal? So therefore, I took my cat to the vet recently and because he had different symptoms. His pooping and peeing was off kilter. He had sort of diarrhea sometimes. He seemed to be getting really, really picky about the food I was feeding him. I was feeding him natural pet food that was gluten-free and wheat, corn, and soy-free and supposedly grain-free. Uh, but I guess it wasn't as healthy as I thought because there was starches. And, you know, instead of just like human food, when they say gluten-free, they replace the wheat and the gluten with rice flour and corn starch and potato starch, which is almost as bad as wheat. So you basically are replacing wheat carbs with potato and rice carbs, which is not good. And then they put carrageenan and guar gum, and they do the same thing in pet food. They put carrageenan and guar gum and potato starch and rice flour and wheat gluten and all kinds of strange things in in cat and dog food, which is really not good for cats and dogs. And basically, I took my cat in to the vet, just a regular vet, not a naturopathic vet. She seems like a very good vet. If I had more money, I'd probably take my cat to a naturopathic vet. But to make a long story short, we tested his blood. She felt him and didn't feel any lumps or bumps on him, which is a good sign. And she said his eyes and ears look good and his nose look good. His mouth look good, except he has a a little crack on one of his teeth, which, you know, he's an older cat. So that makes sense. I got to keep an eye on that. But the blood test showed out high blood sugar. And so we thought he might be diabetic. But to make a long story short, I radically changed his diet to raw meat, freeze-dried food, frozen raw rad cat food, as well as freeze-dried meat cat food for cats. And they also make it for dogs. I went to the uh, health food pet store. My vet did not tell me to do this, but I went online and did a lot of research and I already kind of knew that raw raw food is kind of expensive. You know, you go to the fancy health food pet stores, the big chain pet food stores have some raw and freeze dried food, but not very much. And some of that actually has fruits and vegetables in it, which is not what cats need. They don't need fruits and vegetables. 
I think dogs can eat more in, in terms of fruits and vegetables, but cats are really strictly carnivores. So I switched my kitty Kisun to a diet. It's expensive, but it's worth it. And he loves it. He's been eating every single morsel. So to make a long story short, we thought he might be diabetic. So I got a urine strip test thingy McJagger. And every day I've been testing his urine. He cooperates. I put like a little glass under his bum when he pees and I get like a little urine sample. And then I dip in this like this uh, strip and then I wait 15 seconds to see if his blood sugar is high. I can test his ketones and his, his glucose level. And it's turned out negative every time. So I'm testing every day. So his blood sugar might not actually be elevated. Uh, but I will say that after switching him, I took him off all of his dry food. The vet did tell me cats should not have dry food because it dries them out. And it's not actually good for their teeth that much like they say. So... No more dry food for my kitty. And plus, the dry food actually had potato in it. I was feeding him this supposed all-natural, grain-free dry food, but it has potato in it. And potato is carb, and potato is starch. And so if a cat may or may not be diabetic, you definitely don't want to feed them any kind of potatoes or starch or carbs or wheat. So basically, I now am feeding him this food called Rad Cat, and it's raw frozen meat, and it mostly just has meat in it. It has eggshells crushed up, and it has liver and, and heart and meat. of um, the, It comes in beef, chicken, turkey, and venison, which I guess is deer. So I get this at the health food pet store, and I... Basically, within a few days after feeding him this food, because he was really picky and he was eating and, and peeing, he was drinking a whole lot of water and peeing a whole lot. And to make a long story short, now that I've switched him to freeze-dried uh, raw cat food that's made with meat that you just add a little bit of water to and then you mush it up and turn it into sort of a gravy substance, is mixed in with the more expensive frozen raw meat cat food that's specifically made for cats. Because if you just feed your cat or dog, you know, just your own meat and vegetables, that's supposedly not a well-balanced meal for a cat or dog. You know, out, out in the wild, I guess they would just be catching, you know, live prey and eating raw meat, but they would be eating the bones and the guts and everything. So basically, the food I feed him now is as close to what he would eat in the wild as possible. And his pee and poop is great. He stopped drinking like tons and tons of water. He seems to be drinking a normal amount of water now. He seems to be peeing a normal amount of pee. And his poop is like perfectly, like kind of firm, but not too firm. You know, cute little poop logs, whatever you want to call them little dingleberries coming out of his bum. So his poop seems like, and it's not extra stinky. It just smells kind of like, you know, poop, but not really bad. So he seems to be digesting much better. And he's also not as picky. He, he was like wasting half of the food I was feeding him when I, I tried all kinds of different brands at the natural pet food store that were grain free. But again, they had potato starch and guar gum and carrageenan. So now he, he licks his bowl. He eats every little morsel. So if you have a cat or a dog that seems ill in some way, I highly recommend, you know, feel free to take them to the vet like you're supposed to do. But I would also say try them on raw, freeze-dried, frozen raw food for cats and dogs because it really seems to help. He digests it much more easily than his other food. And he's again eating every single morsel. I still have to test him to make sure he doesn't have worms because he does seem to have a large appetite. And I want to make sure that there aren't parasites or worms that are depleting him. Uh, but he seems to really enjoy the new food I'm feeding him, and it is more expensive. Although then again, you need to feed them less. When they feed him super high quality cat or dog food, they need less of it. It seems like when you give them junk food, they kind of nibble all day. But when this this uh, freeze frozen freeze dried food, they seem to just eat and then be done. So I feed him a few times a day, two or three times a day. And he seems much happier and healthier. And he seems like he's 
I'm, I'm just, I'm going to monitor my cat every single day and make sure, but I'm pretty sure he's not actually diabetic. I'm really hoping because I, I read all about and watched videos on how to inject a cat with insulin and then you have to check their blood sugar uh, a whole lot. And it, it really kind of stresses me out and scares me the idea of having to check his blood sugar every day or every few days, or I'm not sure how often, but because then you have to make sure that you don't give them too much insulin because then they could die of hypoglycemia, their blood sugar could get too low. So you don't want it too high or too low with blood sugar. And I will also say, I know that humans, you know, sometimes humans are diagnosed with type two diabetes that comes, you know, adult onset diabetes later in life. And some people go on insulin to help treat that. But I also know of people who also change their diet, you know, they go on insulin and they change their diet and they stop eating sugar and carbs and they increase their, their protein and their good healthy fats. Cause you know, there's the, we're as a culture, we're really afraid of fat, but the research I've done and my own body as an experiment, I've actually lost weight and burned off fat by eating more fat. So it's a paradox. So. I know of people who were diabetic and they got rid of their diabetes or reversed it or cut it way down to the point where they don't need to take insulin anymore and they eat healthy uh, protein and good healthy fats and very, very low carb and very like low sugar, if, if any sugar at all, hardly any, maybe just fresh fruit, natural sugar, but not refined sugars. So basically, I had a thyroid issue and I went to a doctor and I went to a naturopath actually and they did say that, I, they basically this person put me on medication to help my thyroid because I had underactive thyroid. I forgot what it's called, hypothyroid or hyperthyroid. One is over, one is underactive. When you have overactive thyroid, you tend to lose weight and you can't keep weight on and you can't put weight on and you're underweight and you're kind of hyper. When you have underactive thyroid, you tend to gain weight and you tend to feel lethargic and tired. So basically I had, I had a thyroid that was underactive for a while and they put me on medication for it, which I reluctantly took, but I did take it. And I went off wheat. I went cold turkey, no more wheat, no more bread, no more wheat products, no crackers, no cookies, no, no bread of any kind. And I increased fat. I ate more olive oil more nuts and seeds, basically no grains. I eat occasional potatoes, but I, I stopped eating all rice. I stopped eating oats. I stopped eating wheat. And instead I ate more vegetables and I ate meat and beans and avocado and olive oil and eggs. I've also stopped eating dairy products. It seems like I was eating yogurt, whole fat yogurt for a while because Whole fat dairy is better for you than low fat because low fat dairy and no fat dairy has more lactose, which is milk sugar. If you eat whole fat dairy products the way nature intended, then you get more of the healthy fat and less of the sugar in terms of the proportion of sugar to fat. So I guess nutrition is sort of a hobby of mine. So now I realize that cat and dog and pet nutrition is just as important as human nutrition. I guess that's, that's a no brainer. That's pretty obvious. But basically I ended up losing 40 pounds. I increased my exercise. I've always kind of exercised ever since I was 13 years old. My dad sort of encouraged me. My dad's very athletic. He's like 71 and he's fit as a fiddle. As they say, he exercises and works out a lot. He was a tennis teacher for many years throughout my childhood. My dad is extremely fit. His body uh, fat is as low as it was as a teenager. So he basically still wears the same Levi's he did when he was a teenager. He has no gut at all, 0% gut. So he's living proof. You know, he's kind of like Jack LaLanne. He's proof that you can be an older person and still be fit and not be overweight. Uh, People tend to gain weight as they get older because your metabolism slows down. And if you're not careful about what you eat and you don't stay active, you tend to gain weight as you get older. So basically, I'm off all medication now. I'm not on any thyroid medication anymore. They told me they were over treating me because after about a few months, after about four or five or six months off of wheat, my thyroid started acting normal again. 
So basically, and I also have less mood swings, I still definitely have anxiety and depression and OCD and a a tendency toward mood swings, but off sugar and carbs, I feel much less moody. And in fact, if I ever eat candy or sugar, my moods get worse. I get more moody and grumpy and up and down with my moods. So I know for a fact that for my own body, nutrition is very important. So in terms of my mental health and my physical health, so I'm no longer on any thyroid medication and I'm less moody. And my cat apparently is much healthier on his change of diet. So I went cold turkey because my cat was hardly eating anything that I gave him. And so instead of like slowly trying to switch him over, I just immediately switched him to the raw food. And the first serving I fed him, he loved it. He ate the whole thing. And that was like, gosh, about a week ago or more. And he's been eating ever since every single morsel that I've been feeding him. So I'm really, really happy about that. I am going to rotate the turkey, beef, uh, chicken. I think there's a fish one too, and a venison one. And I feed him raw frozen cat food as well as freeze dried raw cat food, which is mostly just meat and some taurine and added vitamins and minerals to balance it out for a cat. I could also try making my own cat food, but I have to be careful to follow a recipe and make sure that it's got the proper balance of vitamins and minerals and, you know, protein and fat and and really low carb and, of course, no sugar. So my own eating for myself actually uh, hasn't been as good lately during the holiday time but I generally eat, I eat eggs, uh, kale, I eat different meats, I try to eat organic meats, I eat meat, I eat beans, um, I avoid all bread, I don't even eat like gluten-free bread products because they're just full of other kinds of starches besides wheat, they're just full of potato and rice and different other kind of starches. So it's best to just avoid all those kinds of processed breads and crackers. You know, if I have the urge for carbs, I usually eat, I sometimes eat guaranteed gluten-free oats because sometimes oats are mixed with wheat. And then I put flaxseed, chia seed, and hemp seeds in with my oatmeal and I put some blueberries on top. But I also eat like nuts. I eat a lot of nuts. I eat handfuls of mixed nuts. I eat... Um, vegetables, fresh fruit with no sugar added. I, you know, I occasionally eat chocolate and I've eaten some, uh, I've, I've actually ate some wheat on my holiday trip recently to California. One of my relatives made these amazing oatmeal cookies with chia seeds in them. And she made her own granola with olive oil, maple syrup and oats and nuts and, and, uh, walnuts and chia seeds. I also love hemp seeds and flax seeds. So basically my nutrition, and I've lost about 40 pounds. It was about three years ago that I quit eating wheat. And I pretty much think I want to stick with this the rest of my life. My thyroid is still normal. I should probably get it checked again to make sure. But last time I had my thyroid checked at least twice since they told me it was underactive. It's been at normal levels every time they've checked it since then. So nutrition has a very powerful effect on the body. It affects your biochemistry right away. So, you know, within 48 hours, your digestive system can feel the difference if you change what you eat. So I'm really, really grateful that my cat seems to be healthier. And there it is. So this is Shannon Kringen, Goddess Kring. You're listening to podcast number 11. You can go to my YouTube channel to see all 11 podcasts. Every week I do a new one. You can go to my Mixcloud, Goddess Kring Mixcloud, Goddess Kring Patreon, Goddess Kring Bandcamp, and Shannon Kringen is my YouTube channel. So I put this podcast on several different stations or several different websites that's free and archived 24 7. I also have photos of my visual art on Flickr and shannonkringen.com is my main website. I have mp3 music, 
musical things I've made that are free to download. And I have about five different blogs and I have like a Tumblr, a WordPress. I'm on Instagram. I'm all over social media sharing my photos and my words. And I feel grateful to be alive. And I feel like a little bit spaced out today. So thank you for listening. Goddess Kring, Shannon Kring. And it's, again, it's, what is it? December 20, 29th, 2016. We're almost ready for 2017. My name is Shannon Kringen, and you're listening to me improvise on the piano. So that was a little bit of me on the piano, obviously. I just threw that in. Uh, I just will say that my main point of this monologue is just to discuss nutrition and how I wish that medical doctors as well as veterinary people would be taught more about the power of nutrition. I know that we have a pharmaceutical and a drug industry and a medical industry that wants to focus and put money into studying drugs and surgery and things like that. So I guess that's partly why. And there's not as much scientific uh, studies and money to be made maybe on food. Although the, the cat food I feed my cat now is quite expensive. And so I'm happy to give my money to pet food companies that make healthy raw food for cats and dogs that actually is good for their bodies and doesn't harm them or give them diabetes or tax their liver and their kidneys, etc. So I wish that, uh, I think it's only naturopathic doctors actually that are taught in med school about the value of nutrition. And I guess it's mostly nutritionists that are really, you know, people who really study nutrition and get a degree in nutrition. Those are the people that really know about the power of what you eat and how that affects your immune system. Therefore, it affects the rest of your health because really everything you do, everything you eat or drink affects your immune system. And in addition, if you receive a massage, you know, if you enjoy massage and you receive a massage, that increases the dopamine in your body, which makes your body more relaxed and feel good, which also probably helps your immune system. And I know that doing things like having sex and exercising and listening to music and meditation and yoga, basically doing things you enjoy helps your immune system. Because if you're doing what you love and you enjoy being alive, it's going to strengthen your body's will to live. So it's kind of a natural intuitive thing. I guess I'm a very intuitive person. I kind of feel like it's silly to even say the stuff I'm saying because isn't it kind of obvious? But I guess not everybody thinks in these terms. So, you know, I'm also a nude model and I've gone to naturist gatherings and to me that's just so basic and so normal and natural and obvious, but not to everybody. You know, I also don't shave my, uh, my hair, well, except my legs. I, I basically shave my legs, but I don't shave my armpits or my pubic region. And it's totally fine if somebody wants to shave or trim any part of their body hair. But to me, it's like, what's the big deal? Why not just be natural? Because I have a tendency to have sensitive skin and I tend to get a rash. So <laughs> hopefully that's not too much information for you. But then again, what's wrong with talking about things like body hair and shaving? 
And let's see what else is on my mind. This holiday season, my boyfriend actually came with me. We had, uh, for Christmas Eve, we went out to dinner with my dad. And then for Christmas Day, we drove to the country to have a homemade meal with my mom and we helped her cook. So that was a unique holiday experience. I'm an only child and I have no kids of my own. So my holidays are pretty simple. It's just me and my cat, I live by myself, see my boyfriend a few times a week. I also volunteer at the zoo because I love plants and animals and nature. I know some people think the zoo is a very negative place. You could see it a couple different ways. You could see that the animals are trapped and in captivity. You could also see that they're protected. You could also see that if they're injured, they get medical treatment. In the wild, that doesn't happen. A lot of uh, baby animals too also don't survive in the wild. The zoo also does something really cool. They actually breed, uh, I think it's turtles, and they, they help turtles. They breed turtles at the zoo, and they keep them at the zoo protected until they're old enough to be safe from predators, and then they release them into the wild. Because I guess for a while, a lot of frogs were eating baby turtles, and we didn't have very many turtles in the wild around the Seattle area, the Pacific Northwest region and now apparently the turtle population is back up and hopefully the frogs are doing okay as well i'm not sure what the statistics are on that but zoos zoos do conservation projects and zoos actually help animals in the wild and plants in the wild in addition to protecting the animals that are in the zoo but again you could say them you could see that they're they're held captive and that's the dark side and then the other way of the flip side of looking at it is that they're protected from predators, from poachers, from hunters, from from basically their habitat is being destroyed. A lot of lions and tigers and bears and all kinds of different animals, because of human activity, the habitat is being destroyed and taken away and developed. And we are bulldozing land and building human things. And this is taking habitat away from the animals. It would be nice too if we would we would plant more trees and if there were more natural wildlife preserves. I like to fantasize that if I was independently wealthy or I won the lottery or I just got a large sum of money or an unlimited amount of money, one of the things I would do, because I think that's actually a good fantasy to have, like what would you do if money was unlimited to you? What would you do? And could you start doing that now, even if you don't have tons of money? Basically, I love plants and animals and the ecosystem. And one of the things I would love to do with unlimited amount of money is to buy land and save it and declare it a wildlife refuge and save it for the whole ecosystem, for all the little bugs and insects. <clears throat> I mean, I'm somebody who doesn't even kill spiders. I do not... I kill fleas and ticks and mosquitoes, I suppose, if they land on me. But if I see a spider in my apartment, I don't harm it. I leave it alone. I put it outside or I leave it alone, you know, especially if it doesn't seem dangerous. I just let it be. And I don't kill flies or moths. You know, I don't want to kill something unless I have to, although I do eat meat, so I'm not perfect. In a perfect world, I would go out and hunt my own meat because... I think if I had to hunt my own meat, I probably would be vegetarian because I don't really like killing animals, but I love meat and my body likes the protein. So if I was perfect, I would probably be vegetarian or again, I would, I would hunt my own meat or I would only buy local sm small farm meat that's no antibiotics, no hormones, free range animals that get to run around in a pasture and, and, and live like normal animals and then get slaughtered quickly one day. So those are some of my feelings about that. <laughs> so I am somebody who feels a little stressed out today. I'm going to go see my therapist soon. And she's a new therapist of mine. And we are talking about my issues, my boundary issues, and my basically self-relationship issues, how to improve the relationship I have with myself so that I may improve the relationship I have with my family and my friends and my career. 
So I'm sitting here looking at my cat. He's taking a nap. He looks happy and healthy and comfortable, and I'm hoping that that's the case. And I'm hoping for 2017 that I can expand the self-care that I'm doing for myself and my cat, continue healing and growing and learning. I like to say healing reveals the dreams. I don't always know what I want. I'm sometimes confused about who the real me is. I'm really happy that I make a living full-time as a freelance model. I also deliver groceries sometimes, although I find that job very stressful, but there's a smartphone app that I use where I get to deliver groceries in my spare time. And you just run around in your car and you pick up orders and you deliver and you get paid for that, but you have to pay your own taxes on that. So it's not super duper lucrative. I'm pretty much still low income. I do have a degree degree in graphic design and I do have a bachelor's degree from Antioch University in Seattle, Bachelor of Arts and Humanities. What is it called? It's called Liberal Studies. But I haven't really tried to get a job doing that, but I just don't think I want to. I think I'm a full-time freelance person. It's really strange. I'm really not feeling very creative today. It's very strange. I think I'm in my space out mode. I'm still adjusting to being back from Santa Barbara, California, where I visited relatives. And this whole health scare with my cat really kind of stressed me out. I was really scared that he was diabetic. I really hope that he's not. I'm pretty sure that feeding him raw food is really helping his body and he seems to be digesting really well. I've checked his blood sugar or his urine sugar level about four times and it shows up as negative every time so far and I will continue checking it. And if he continues having symptoms, I might get his blood tested again, but for right now, he seems to be doing well. So this is Shannon Kring and you're listening to the Goddess Kring podcast radio show. I wanted to also talk about a high school memory I had recently. You know, the Rolling Stones have a new album that's blues covers. And when I when I was in high school, before I got really, really into Tom Petty, I mean, I've always been into Tom Petty since I was 11 years old. But I used to be equally into the Rolling Stones and Mick Jagger specifically. I used to dance around my living room. My mom would be in her art studio. And instead of having imaginary friends as a teenager, I had an imaginary audience. And I would be in my living room and I would put on like two hour concerts and I would lip sync to Blondie and Joan Baez, The Doors, The Rolling Stones, Pink Floyd, Tom Petty, The Police, Stevie Nicks, etc. Maybe some pretenders as well. Chrissy Hind and all that jazz. So I had a lot of fun doing that. And I would memorize the lyrics. I would get records and I would memorize and write down the lyrics and rehearse them over and over. I mean, I would sing along and imitate these performers. I especially loved imitating Mick Jagger, dancing around and doing his mannerisms. I love how androgynous Mick Jagger is. I once lip synced My high school thought I was very shy, but I wasn't actually underneath the facade of being a shy person. I was not very shy at all. The funnest thing I ever did in high school was lip sync to the Rolling Stones song, She's So Cold. And I danced around. I put men's long johns on and I had some wingtip shoes. I stuffed my pants to make myself look like I had a penis. I took my boobs and strapped them down, I think with duct tape underneath, you know, on top of my bra. I smushed my boobs down and I made my lips look bigger with lip liner. And at the time I had a haircut that was similar to Mick Jagger's haircut in the 80s. I graduated from high school in 1986 from South Woodby High School on Woodby Island near Seattle. And I basically, we had a smoke machine and I rehearsed for weeks. I rehearsed at my grandma's house on the VHS videotape. The only tape I had of the Rolling Stones at the time was Harlem Shuffle. 
And so I watched that Harlem Shuffle video over and over and over. And I watched how Mick Jagger danced and how he moved his arms and legs and his facial expressions. And I tried to imitate them. And so I think it was 1985 or 86, I got up in front of my entire high school and I lip synced and danced to She's So Cold by the Rolling Stones. And I shook my ass and I thrusted like a man. And I was just very, I guess women thrust too. I was just very sexual on stage in front of my entire high school. And I shocked the hell out of them. They were like, oh my God, we thought Shannon Kringen was a quiet, shy person who was afraid to even raise her hand in class. And here she is dancing around like Mick Jagger in front of the whole high school, kind of making a fool out of myself. And at the same time, I think I did a pretty good job, actually, but I think I was pretty goofy and silly. That's one of the things I like about Mick Jagger is I don't think he takes himself all that seriously. He's up there having fun, dancing and singing and sort of playing the role of Mick Jagger. You know, it's like very dramatic and I love that. So that's just the best high school memory I have because kids did pick on me in high school and I wasn't particularly popular, although I got really good grades. I loved my teachers. I think I was more friends with my teachers than I was with my peers. I was kind of a serious student. I was kind of a rebel and I was kind of a loner. I had a few friends, but I was kind of a misfit because I wasn't a stoner. I was a good student. I took class seriously. I loved to learn. I was also on the tennis team and did really well at that. <clears throat> God, I can hear that my throat is all dry today. Can you hear that? Usually my voice is much more clear. I think I'm fighting something off. Probably need a cough drop. My voice is really raspy right now. Can you hear that? <clears throat> Excuse me. Excuse me while I kiss this guy. Excuse me while I kiss this guy. Excuse me while I kiss the sky, you know, Jimi Hendrix. Excuse me while I kiss the sky. <laughs> I changed the words. So I love doing that in high school. I wish that I had done more performing. I was in a couple plays. My girlfriend and I also lip synced David Bowie and Mick Jagger doing Dancing in the Street. And she was David Bowie and I was Mick Jagger. And we rehearsed a lot for that, which was so fun. I loved performing that. I wanted to do it again once it was over. <laughs> I wanted to do more performing. I've been an extra in a film, one called American Heart with Jeff Bridges. I didn't get to do any scenes with Jeff Bridges, but I did tap Jeff on the shoulder and introduce myself to him and met him. Embarrassingly, I gave Jeff Bridges a nude photo of myself. I kind of wish that I hadn't done that, but I had hand painted boots that I did in the photo and he looked at the photo and went, oh, did you paint your boots? <laughs> he said nothing about the fact that I was naked. Oh, gee, thanks for the naked picture of yourself. That's really embarrassing that I did that. At the time, I danced at the Lusty Lady. So it was kind of like inappropriate behavior, but he was very cordial and nice to me. And he mentioned, oh, I like your pan painted boots. <laughs> that was very good of him. But I probably freaked him out. And I regret that I did that. I wish that I had done something a little different. This was when The Fisher King was out, one of my favorite Jeff Bridges movies, The Fisher King with Robin Williams and Jeff Bridges and directed by Terry Gilliam. Great movie. So I met Jeff Bridges and was an extra in American Heart and really liked the acting process. Got to stand on the corner in Pioneer Square in Seattle <clears throat> with a bunch of punk rockers. What else? I've hitchhiked through Mexico. I've had breast reduction surgery. I've had an abortion. I mean, I've been through a lot in my life. I'm 48 years old, spilling my guts. I had a public access TV show called Goddess Kring on every week for 15 years where I it was kind of like a video diary and danced around nude and talked about whatever was on the top of my head. The other thing is did you guys recently hear the Madonna speech? I'm not a huge Madonna music fan. I like bits and pieces of her music very much. But mostly what I love about her is her is her audacity, her strength, her rebellious energy, her highly sexual, sensual, yet highly spiritual persona. And that comes through from her psyche. And she recently won Women of the Year Award 
from the Billboard Music Awards or something like that. I don't even have a TV. I just saw it online. Like I got rid of my, I have a TV, but it's just hooked up to a VCR. So I don't have any digital cable TV. I got rid of that in like 2007. Most of what's on TV, I don't want to watch, but I listened to the Madonna speech twice and it made me cry both times. A woman who did a, released a sex book who also wrote children's books about girls who were jealous and competitive and mean to each other. And then they realized that they were judging each other too harshly. I was very moved by her speech where she talked about feminism and how men are free to dance around and be sexy and yet women are not. Or women are told that they're whores and sluts and they're objectifying themselves and you either have to be an intelligent woman or a sexy woman. And I relate to that. I relate to the absurdity that it's silly to think somebody is one dimensional. Just because they're sexual doesn't mean they're not also intelligent. And just because they're intelligent doesn't mean they aren't are also sexual. And just because someone isn't sexual, you know, doesn't mean they don't have value as well. And she talked, Madonna talked about how being a real feminism is to be supportive of other women, even if they're doing something you're not comfortable with. She, she shocked the audience when she said being a feminist to her is about not being subservient and being how men want her to be or men don't want her to be. But it's also about not being subservient to how women are comfortable with you being. And I guess Camille Paglia a famous feminist who's written books, said Madonna put women back 50 years and that she's way too sexual and that that's tacky and trashy. And then Madonna realized right then and there, okay, I guess I'm a bad feminist. But the thing is, a real feminist wouldn't say that. Like Gloria Steinem has actually said things about women, assuming that women are objectifying themselves and being subservient to men if they pose for Playboy or they, you know, do nude modeling. I mean, I'm a nude model and I've done some erotic nude modeling and I've done some erotic modeling that I don't think is very high quality, but I did it for the money and I did it to experiment with how it feels to do that in front of an audience. (coughs) Well, Madonna acknowledged in her speech that when these photos came out of her posing nude for artists, way back in the day when she was just trying to make ends meet, trying to get her own career off off, uh, and running. She said that she was supposed to be ashamed of these photos, but she was not. And she acknowledged that she looked bored in those photos probably because she was bored. (laughs) Because she really wanted to do her own career and not just pose for other people. I sometimes feel that way when I pose for other artists, but then again, I see it as a way of meditating and relaxing. When I pose nude for artists and they draw and paint me, or when I pose with clothes on and they're doing portraits of me, sometimes it can feel boring because I'm just sitting there staring off into space and the people drawing and painting me get to create the art. But I do get to be amused and try to inspire them. I also get to sit and relax or meditate and be quiet and go within and daydream, which I do enjoy doing. But I'm also an artist in my own right. And so sometimes I feel bored and I I frustrated and like, hey, what about my art? But then again, I got into modeling because it pays. So, excuse me. Basically, when Madonna did this speech, I just, I related and identified with some of what she said about modeling and not being ashamed. Why should you be ashamed of modeling nude? What's the point? I mean, if you're going to be a nude model, If you feel ashamed of it, then don't do it. But if you actually want to be a nude model, do it. And don't let other people tell you that you should feel ashamed of it. So I I like that she said that. And I like what she said about women and about how if you're a feminist, don't let other women put you down. Don't let other women oppress you. Don't let women shame you for being the kind of woman that you want to be. Marilyn Monroe is probably a prime example, although I do think that Marilyn Monroe herself seemed to enjoy being in front of cameras and being seductive and sexual, but she also felt trapped by it, and she wanted to do more serious acting, and maybe they didn't give her a chance and take her seriously, but I also think, you know, Hollywood, but I also think that Marilyn Monroe herself was sort of trapped in this Marilyn Monroe persona, and she couldn't get out of it. For whatever reason, it was probably partly her own relationship with herself. I feel like 
Marilyn Monroe never learned how to really love herself in a way. And maybe she thought her her main thing was being sexual and, and beautiful and, you know, the magical, beautiful Marilyn Monroe that we know. Although I loved her vulnerability in her eyes and her emotions in her eyes. She seemed like a highly sensitive, intelligent human being to me. So when I heard Madonna say these different things, it just struck a chord in me about feminism and about usually when feminists speak, they talk about the patriarchy and how men are oppressing women and, and women are supposed to bow down to men or do what men want them to do or not, don't be too powerful because that's like what men are supposed to do. Some feminists have the courage to bring up women and how sometimes women can oppress other women by stereotyping and making assumptions about what another woman should or shouldn't do. And Gloria Steinem has said things that upset me about women posing nude and assuming that they're just doing that for men and they're not doing it because they actually want to express themselves sexually and feel powerful and feel confident about their sexuality. I mean, it's true that men are taught to be proud of their penises but are women taught to be proud of their vaginas? So that's a whole nother thing right there is shaming a woman, a woman for having a vagina, you know, that has secretions and has a smell. I mean, come on. So, <laughs> so basically sexuality and sensuality and intelligence and the freedom to express yourself. I mean, androgyny. I love what Madonna said about Prince and David Bowie were two of her heroes when she was first starting out because she saw them as being androgynous men who were breaking the rules. And, you know, women, powerful women who are, I mean, I think really, I'm more into the Jungian way of seeing things that every man has feminine aspects and every woman has masculine. We all have male and female traits within us, whether we're male or female or transgender or a hermaphrodite, or androgynous, or asexual, or whatever, we all have male and female traits. That's how I feel. I'm definitely in touch with my masculine side. So I like people, I'm, a lot of my favorite artists are, are men and women who are comfortable with their male and female aspects. I even see Tom Petty, who widens my jetty, as an androgynous person. He's kind of a sensitive, romantic man. A lot of his songs are written with tremendous amount of compassion for the female perspective, although he's kind of macho at the same time. That's a whole nother story. Tom Petty and Tori Amos are my two favorite male and female singer, songwriter, performer type people. They're both Americans, I guess. That's true. They're both white and American. I guess I don't have to feel defensive about that. I am American and I grew up exposed to lots of American music. But I see both Tom Petty and Tori Amos as in touch with their male and female sides. Tori Amos is very influenced by Robert Plant. Another thing recently what happened is my dad was saying that that version of Stairway to Heaven covered by heart. He likes that more than the original by Led Zeppelin. And he's like, it's a no brainer. And I'm like, well, I beg to differ because I listened to it recently again to make sure and sure enough, I prefer the Led Zeppelin original to the heart cover of Stairway to Heaven. But it was nice to see that song honored in a respectful manner and taken seriously. Because some people think of Stairway to Heaven as just a cliche old rock song. But that's actually a very brilliant, well-crafted, amazing song. So there it is. There's a little bit of music riffraff for you. You're listening to Shannon Kringen, Goddess Kring, podcast number 11. I apologize that my voice is a bit scratchy today. I'm not feeling all that great. I'm fighting off a cough and a cold, I guess. I thought I just had an allergy to the mold that's out here. When I was in California, Santa Barbara, I had absolutely no symptoms of, you know, cough or runny nose or anything. And then as soon as I, and I love the eucalyptus trees and the ocean and the dry air in Santa Barbara, and then I came back to Seattle and immediately started feeling sick. But I guess I just caught a bug on the airplane or something. So thanks for listening. My name is Shannon Kringen, Goddess Kring. For a living, I model for art classes full time, which is a miracle in itself. 
I have a website, shannonkringen.com, where I link to my photos, my videos, my blogs, my music, my poetry, my MP3s. I'm kind of all over the map as an artist. I sometimes wish that I could focus. I'm learning to have more compassion. What I mean is focus more on one art form. I guess photography is my biggest talent, but I also love to draw pure abstraction with pastel oil and chalk pastel as well as acrylic paint. I love to model. I got into modeling because it pays. I'm low income, but I survive. So I recently was lucky enough to receive a Section 8 voucher. So now my rent is only a third of my income, which is amazing. I wish that everybody's rent could only be a third of their income. Here in Seattle, we have no rent control and people can jack the rent up as much as they want, anytime they want, as long as they just give you 60 days notice. So that's a little scary. If you don't make tons of money and your rent goes up, that's a different problem. I'm sad to see so many more homeless people in Seattle. Now when I drive on the side of the freeway, I see so many tents and it's sad to see this. So I wish that we could find a solution to these problems. I also wish there were more solar panels and electric cars. And I wish Bernie Sanders could be the president of the United States. He was my favorite candidate for president in this country we call United States of America, which is kind of more like USA Incorporated. I feel like it's more of a corporation that we all work for, sadly. I wish we had more democracy. I wish that in our voting system we would abolish the electoral college or the college electoral, how, however you say that. I'm a little dyslexic, so I flip things around backwards sometimes. Whatever it's college electoral, electoral college, however you're supposed to say it. I wish we'd, we could abolish that and change the laws and the Constitution or whatever it takes to change it so that it's one person, one vote. If I was king of the world, I would have everybody 18 and over would be automatically registered to vote in the USA. And maybe you'd have to pay a fine if you didn't vote to discourage people from not voting. So if everyone 18 and over in the United States voted if they could, and if they're handicapped or, or deve developmentally disabled, then maybe they could get a medical clearance for not voting if they really can't vote for mental or physical reasons. But everyone who can vote, who's 18 and over, should be somehow encouraged to vote and make it very easy, do absentee ballots, and it should be one person, one vote. So that in the local and federal elections, we could have every single vote counted, every adult equals one vote, and not have some kind of strange, like certain states and certain humans have more power than others. Because to me, a real democracy is when everyone is equal, whether you're rich or poor, young or old, sick or healthy. Same thing with healthcare. I would have single payer healthcare, which would be nonprofit, paid for by taxes, and the federal government in the United States would crack down on pharmaceutical companies and force them and regulate them to keep the prices low of medications and drugs, like they already do in other countries. Companies in England are rewarded for keeping the prices low and nonprofit. So, you know, healthcare is a basic human service, not some kind of luxurious, like stay at a fancy hotel or a spa. I feel like healthcare should be treated like the public library. Whether you're young, old, rich, poor, sick, or healthy, you should be able to access the medical system and go to the doctor, even if you're homeless or unemployed, you should be able to go into a clinic and see the doctor and get treatment. And it shouldn't be millions of dollars and thousands of dollars and other countries that already works this way. I have a friend in Norway and a couple friends in England and I've asked them many questions on how it works. And I met somebody in Scotland and I interviewed him about the healthcare system there. And it's much different than it is here. Although I am low income and I do have my Obamacare and I have free to low cost healthcare right now, I have access to a therapy, a therapist every week 
I went to a support group, a therapy class every week for a while because I have borderline personality tendencies as well as OCD and anxiety and depression tendencies, although I don't believe in labeling myself, but I meet the criteria for some of these problems. Some of these, instead of calling it a mental disorder, I would say a mental habit, a bad habit that I got into as a child to deal with the stress of my childhood. I developed certain patterns of thinking and so my job in therapy is to try to unlearn these and to try to learn how to create new neuropathways in my brain and try to create different ways of, of thinking and behaving that will be more loving and nurturing and nourishing to myself. So I'm learning a lot as I go and I'm very, very grateful that I have my Obamacare right now because I'm low income. In Washington state, we have something called Apple Care which is very good. It's kind of like Medicare slash Medicaid. I'm not sure which, but it's for low income people like me. And I am able to get one eye exam per year, one teeth cleaning per year. And I think cavities or fillings are included in that. If I need anything extra fancy with my eyes or my dental care, then I think I have to pay, but I think it's still lower than the high price that most people pay. So I am extremely grateful and extremely fortunate to have this, and I hope that it can continue. I think I'm guaranteed my low-income health care until the end of 2018, or at least the end of 2017. With Donald Trump as the President of the United States, which seems like a joke to me still, even saying that out loud sounds absurd, I'm not sure how much they can ruin our health care system. We'll see what happens with that. I wonder how much damage they can do if they want to let the wealthy people continue hoarding the money and hoard even more money and they want to cut social programs. That's really sad, but I don't know. I don't want to dwell on that. I listen to Robert Reich on Facebook sometimes and I like some of the things he has to say. I'm a huge Bernie Sanders fan. I really wish that we could have Bernie Sanders as the president of the United States. I don't think that they, the powers that be, would ever let him in. If we had one person, one vote, maybe he could have won the nomination and maybe he could have beat Mr. Donald Trump. But uh, Bernie Sanders is somebody who I really admire because he's not financially corrupt. And he's he's like a true Democrat out there, like a social, social, like a, Democratic socialism is more, that's what I was going to say, democratic socialism is more democratic than democratic capitalism. Because when you have money corrupting things and when rich corporations and wealthy, powerful people dominate and control things, then it lessens the amount of actual democracy. If you have socialism mixed with democracy, that means that every person is equal, that whether you're rich or poor, your voice matters. And so I see Bernie Sanders as somebody that's out there speaking for the regular people, not just the rich people and the rich corporations. So democratic socialism is something that I'm a huge fan of mixed in with some capitalism. But when capitalism is unregulated and out of control, then wealthy people dominate and boss us all around. And so then the poor and the middle class don't have as much power as the wealthy private citizens and the wealthy corporations. Like corporations like Walmart are allowed to pay their people really low wages and people aren't allowed to have unions. You know, that's, that's really sad. I mean, to me, having a union fighting for high wages and having good benefits and health care for all, that's a more true democracy than capitalism, which lets money boss us all around, and we're a slave to low wages and wealthy people who hoard all the money. So democratic socialism is more democratic than capitalism that's out of control. Democratic capitalism has gotten less democratic, you see, because money corrupts. So therefore, democratic socialism is more democratic. You see my point? It's sad to me that this is happening, and I wonder how bad it's going to get. I'm fortunate I have Section 8 housing. I have low-income health care. 
Uh, I'm so grateful. So I'll see you next week. Podcast number 12 will be next week, a week from today. It's every Thursday I make a new podcast. Thanks for tuning in. Shannon Kringen, Goddess Kring. You can email me with questions or comments. ShannonKringen.com. Find my email. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Goddess Kring Radio. Shannon Kringen, Goddess Kring. Shannon Kringen, Goddess Kring. Goddess Kring Radio. Shannon Kringen, Goddess Kring. Shannon Kringen, Goddess Kring. Goddess Kring Radio, Shannon Kringen, Goddess Kring, Shannon Kringen, Goddess Kring.